we'll just give it a couple minutes and then uh, we'll let, get the class started. Thank you again for joining me and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun today and learn something as well. So it's about two o'clock, um, two o'clock my time. Let's uh, give it a couple minutes and then we'll get started with the class. All right, well, it's been a couple minutes, so uh, let's just get started, and if somebody joins late, so be it. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm happy that you're taking time out of your day to bother to listen to me about rum. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we learn something today, and uh, besides just making cocktails, and have fun along the way. Uh, rum is something I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about out there, unfortunately. So this presentation is kind of aimed at clarifying that. At least there's misconceptions here in the United States. I can't speak to what part of the world you might be in. So let's try to fix that here. I think a lot of people are thinking of tropical vacations, pina coladas, sugary sweet drinks, when necessarily that isn't the uh, correct thought about rum. Uh, rum is actually, when they make it, no sweeter than scotch whiskey or vodka, for instance. It's just that uh, what they do to it after they process it, um, adding caramel coloring, sugar, that sort of thing that makes rum have that extra, um, uh, excuse me, I'm just seeing a note on the computer, uh, seeing that it might be a little bit uh, sweeter, but we'll go into that in just a moment. So a little bit about me. I grew up in New York. No, because like he needed. Oh, <laughs> somebody wasn't muted there. So uh, I grew up in the United States, uh, California, Northern California, and I've only been in hospitality, uh, bars and restaurants my whole career. Started as a dishwasher, and I worked my way up. I was a valet until I scratched a car. And then that put a, a quick end to that. And then I moved inside and started the busing tables, waiting tables, bartended throughout college, and, um, and made a, a real life of it. After college, I worked for a whiskey company, Jack Daniels Whiskey, uh, as a salesman, terrible salesman. <laughs> so I got out of that uh, very quickly. And then got into bar and restaurant management, where I've been ever since. I have worked in different parts of the United States, from Hawaii to Arizona, California. I was the assistant director of beverage for a casino in Las Vegas and overseeing their whole beverage department. So I really have a passion uh, for beverages and also teaching because I think that's a lot of fun for somebody to discover a beverage they don't know or to discover um, just more about something that they, they might enjoy as well. Uh, that brings me to where I currently am. I'm here in lovely Miami, Florida, United States. Uh, as a director of food and beverage uh, until the current COVID um, uh, break. So enough of that. I do have a website though that I'm most proud of to train people like yourself, like people that want to learn more either to get in the hospitality industry or they just want to be experts or really know about beverages. So it's called beverageedu or bevedu.com uh, and you can go there, learn about whiskey, uh, rum, tequila, mezcal, wine, everything's on there. And just because you're viewing this presentation today, I got a great deal for you, 50% off uh, annual membership. It's usually $69 a year for access to all my courses. I got wine tutorials, how to open a, a bottle of wine properly, champagne, 
how to savor a bottle of champagne, lots of stuff there. Uh, it's half off. So you're going to get that for $34.99 today. There'll be a code that you can get. Uh, I'm not sure how we'll get that to you. I can work that out with the good people here. Uh, but you'll get a discount just for watching. And I really appreciate that. Hopefully you get something out of it. It's 100% money back guarantee. So if you don't like it, I don't want your money if you don't feel like it's worth it. So uh, we'll go from there. But enough about me. Uh, let's get into rum and today's presentation. So today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to clarify some of the myths about rum. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about production, aging, etc. Different types of rum, which hopefully you can read my terrible handwriting here. And then uh, we're going to make a few cocktails, which is always fun as well. So as you may or may not know, rum is made from sugar cane. And that probably is why most people think that it is sweet. Um, just because it's made from sugar cane doesn't necessarily make it sweet. But like I said, we'll get into that. It's mostly made in Latin America and the Caribbean, but it is made all over the world as well. I, I do know that Australia, Canary Islands, uh, Belize, to Brazil. Uh, basically, everybody makes some form of rum. Lighter rum, um, at which we'll get into the different grades and class classifications of rum. Uh, lighter rums are typically used in cocktails, like uh, vodka would be, because there's less flavor in a lighter rum versus a dark rum, which is kind of meant to be consumed by itself, um, either neat or cooking, or you just put it with a couple ice cubes, which is kind of what how I like to do it. Um, but um, we'll go on from there. So there's basically two basic classifications of rum, and those are based off of how it's made. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have, pardon me. So you have agricultural or industrial rum. Agricultural, and so it's important to kind of know how rum is made so that you can understand the different flavor profiles that come from it, come with it. So agricultural uh, or agricultural rum is one style, and then industrial or industrial, with the French, uh, and I apologize to anybody, any French uh, speakers uh, for any mispronunciations along this course way. So it all comes from sugar cane, but it's the root of how the distillation process starts that uh, really tells you how the final flavor profile is going to be. So kind of to, to further explain these two styles, agricultural or industrial. Um, basically, uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an analogy. A desert aisle, uh, if you're ever stranded on a desert aisle, I'm going to explain to you how to make alcohol. So if nothing else from this presentation, you're going to know how to make alcohol. Good stuff, right? <laughs> so think about it. You're, you're stuck on a desert aisle. And there happens to be sugar cane growing. There could be coconuts and other stuff. Basic way to make alcohol is that you need sugar, you need fermentation, and you need uh, distillation. So fermentation, easy. No matter what part of the world you may be living in, uh, you may or may not know this, there's wild yeasts blowing around in the air. And of course, different parts of the world, there's different kinds of yeasts, strains, that blow. So all that yeast does uh, with sugar is it consumes sugar, and then it has waste product. The waste products that yeast expels is CO2, carbon dioxide, bubbles. So that's actually how you get bubbles in champagne or beer. But that's for another presentation. And the waste, it excretes alcohol. So basically, if you have some form of sugar, uh, sugary liquid, Wild yeast, you know, let's say you have an open bucket of sugar, you know, let me dial it back. I apologize. You have sugar cane, which I have here. So this is already stripped down. You can't probably see it too well, but sugar cane. So you're on your desert aisle. You cut down the sugar cane and you squeeze it out. And there's going to be the water, the juice, the sugary juice that's in there, right? Um, so you, you squeeze it out and you have the sugary liquid. Now there's wild yeasts in the air and you have an open bucket. So it, the wild yeasts 
fall onto the bucket of sugary liquid, okay? Now, what the yeast is gonna do is, you know, chomp, chomp, chomp. It's gonna eat the sugar that's in the liquid, right? It's gonna excrete, it's gonna burp bubbles, and then it's going to excrete alcohol. And that's essentially how beer is made. That's how any kind of alcohol is made. You just need sugar in some form, yeast to consume it, and then to expel it, right? So that's the very basic of any kind of alcohol. So again, if you're ever stuck on a desert aisle, you are set with some information there, right? So we start with that. So um, it went through the process, you know, you squeeze the juice, you got it, okay. So now you have beer, essentially you have beer. So with the beer, um, you, you need now to distill it somehow, right? So basic distillation is, uh, you're just creating alcohol vapor. Now, you may or may not know this, alcohol boils at a lower temperature than water, right? So that's how distillation is made. So again, back to the Desert Isle, you have a copper pot or whatever pot you may have, right? You put that beer that you made, you wanna strain off all the gunk, all the dead yeast and whatever stuff fell in, right? If you had it in a bucket. <laughs> so you put it in a still, cook it, right? the alcohol is going to uh, boil first and it's gonna, the steam's gonna rise, right? Steam rises and, and you should have on your vessel of some sort, should be closed. And then you, you I'm sure you've seen in the movies or, or elsewhere, there is a uh, usually a coiled um, metal tube that comes out, right? That is uh, to condense the alcohol. So the steam rises, it hits the tube and usually that's a chilled tube uh, of some sort and it condenses back into um, a liquid form, right? So from the gas form of alcohol steam, hits that cools and then it turns into a liquid and it comes out drip by drip by drip and that's alcohol and essentially that's rum, right? And that is rum agricole or agricultural. It's just fresh sugarcane juice, right? Beer, distill it and then it's fresh, right? Now the other type of rum, I hope that makes sense to everybody. Now the other thing is industrial, okay? So industrial is uh, just as you may think. It's industrial, like factories, right? So the other way to do rum is to cut down the sugar can. You're off the desert aisle now, right? We're back to civilization. Now uh, they squeeze the sugar cane, and quite honestly, I have no idea how you make regular sugar. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, powdered, um, crystallized, you know, granulated sugar, right? Uh, when they make granulated sugar, there's a byproduct, and that is molasses. And I'm sure we all know molasses, right? Dark, syrupy, rich uh, molasses. So instead of just throwing the, the molasses out a long time ago, they figured out, well, we could do something with this. Hey, um, excuse me. <clears throat> we could ferment it, and we can make... Uh, rum out of it, right? So that's the other kind of rum. So essentially, it's the same thing. Instead of starting with the fresh sugar cane juice, you start with the molasses. Add the yeast and water, right? Yeast cells come along, eat everything, burp up the CO2, excrete the alcohol. You got your beer from the molasses. Put that into a still, cook it, alcohol vaporizes, and then you have your other version of rum. Again, there's a lot more steps um, that I'm sure, you know, goes into it, but at a real basic level, that's what it is. That's industrial rum. Uh, so now you know the kind of the two main types. From, if you think about molasses, uh, it's dark, it's rich, right? Uh, maybe oily, and it has some characteristics to it. Um, it's going to have a final product that's different than if you're using fresh uh, sugarcane juice, right? It's going to be lighter. Uh, more vegetal, um, that kind of thing, right? Floral, perhaps, because it's more, there's less involved, right? Um, and those are the two main variations. Um, from there, so, so now we understand kind of the two basic methods of production. There is, you know, they also age and blend it and do God knows how many things to rum. There's not as many classifications with rum as there are, excuse me, there's not as many standards with rum as there are with other spirits around the world. So there's more freedom to 
add things. Um, most often it's cut caramel coloring or uh, sweeteners or something like that that are, are really going to uh, determine what kind of rum it is and also kind of the style. Um, there's three countries that are kind of known for their uh, rum production from colonization times back, uh, which we'll go into next. So um, that's going to help you kind of understand when you see a bottle of rum, if you see what country it's um, you know, from, maybe that'll help you kind of understand the flavor profile that you're going to be getting. At least you're going to know what type of rum it is. So to start off, we have English rums, okay? English rums are typically um, going to be industrial, made from molasses, okay? Made in the Caribbean, um, as, they, as the English colonized a, a lot of the Caribbean a long time ago, uh, that's how those styles developed there. Um, think of countries like Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Virgin Islands, St. Lucia, that kind of thing. Those are going to be English style rums. They're known to be darker, uh, richer, bold, aromatic. I hope you can read my handwriting here. I apologize. Uh, spiced uh, and rich. Basically just a dark, rich product. Great, great rums uh, in the English style, right? Um, then we move on. You have French rum, or, and it's rum spelled with an H in French spelling, or rum agricole. So that's over here. It's agricole or agricultural, <clears throat> excuse me, agricultural style rum. Since that is, again, remember, fresh sugar cane, it's going to be lighter. It's going to be dry. It's going to be floral maybe grassy, herbal, vegetal, fruity. And then when you age it, it actually picks up very complex flavors. Um, there's a lot of great uh, rums out there of this style. Fruitier nose, um, maybe a, a drier mouthfeel as well. Uh, when you're thinking of these countries, you get, just think of French uh, Car Caribbean countries. So French Guiana, Haiti, uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, all these are um, um, French colonizations, so you get to get those kind of uh, rums. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and then lastly, you have Spanish style rums. So Spanish style rums are typically lighter, a little bit more spirity, alcoholy, a little oily, complex. Um, they can go anywhere from sweeter to crisper, and then they get more complex. Any rum is going to get complex when you age it. It'll be nuttier, uh, smooth, um, buttery, um, other good qualifiers to describe that kind of rum. Uh, obviously, we have Puerto Rico, Cuba, the two main known Spanish style uh, countries known for producing that kind of rum. We have Colombia, Venezuela, Guatemala, a very popular style, uh, the industrial style, again, made from molasses as, as, the, as the base. But very popular as well. So now you understand the two main classifications, right? Then we have different grades of rum, okay? So that's going to be over here. I hope you can see all that. Uh, you have light rums. Light rums, again, almost like vodka. Very, uh, the way I say almost like vodka is that it's lighter, uh, it's clear. Not all light rums have been unaged. So there's a uh, process. So when you age any rum, it's going to pick up some color from the, from the barrels, right? From the oak barrels, being uh, charred or uncharred. Um, what some producers do is they age the rum, uh, the clear rum, because any actual alcohol that comes out of the still is going to be clear when you're done with it. It doesn't matter what, what you started it with, right? It's clear. You put it into the barrel, it's going to pick up some color and some flavor. So some producers like to age it, but they don't want the color for their light rums. So what they do is they filter it a little bit and it takes all that color out, but you still have the flavor. So some places, um, some producers do that for light rums. Light rums are great for making cocktails just because they're so versatile, like vodka. It's, uh, it's not adding a ton of flavor. It's adding a little bit of flavor, but it's just a versatile spirit that can kind of go into anything because it's more neutral. You have gold rums. 
A gold rose is more medium bodied. Uh, it's anywhere between a, uh, a light rum to a dark rum, obviously, right? It's gold. Different ways of making this is slightly aging the rum, so it picks up some color, some flavoring, or some other producers will take light rum and they'll just add some aged rum to it, get it to the color that they want, and call it a day. Call it, uh, excuse me, call it gold rum. Or um, they'll just add coloring, caramel coloring most often, to call it gold rum. Uh, those are also good in cocktails. Um, you can use them for floats top of the glass or you can just mix it in and it adds a different uh, amount of flavor or it adds um, a little bit of color as well. Uh, dark rums. Um, dark rums are obviously known by their color. They can be brown, black, even red sometimes. Typically with dark rums you could think uh, the reason it got so dark was either that they aged, they aged the hell out of it um, and or they added a lot of caramel color. So it's not to say that uh, dark rum is a bad thing, not by any means. It's just that probably there was a lot more done to that rum after it was distilled than other rums. Versa it's a, a versatile as in you can use it for probably not as many cocktails as like a light rum, but it's still good either for coloring or uh, for, dark, for dark drinks. Uh, dark and stormy, um, other uh, drinks as, as well. S strong spices can usually be detected, caramel overtones, like I said. If they're adding a lot of caramel or even molasses uh, to get that dark color, you're going to pick that up in the final spirit. Um, spice rums. So spice rums is typically, you know, they're going to be taking an aged or light rum, maybe gold rum, and then they add sugar in the form of molasses or caramel. And then spices, you're thinking cinnamon, anise, um, what else have I heard of that? Rosemary sometimes, pepper. Um, they're kind of fun. I, I know in, in college here in the United States, uh, Captain Morgan spiced rum is very popular. I don't know how it is around the world, but it's pretty enjoyable out here. You put that with Coke. Uh, it's a very sweet drink, which most younger people tend to enjoy but uh, people really like it. I used to drink that actually quite a bit myself when I was quite younger. Uh, we have flavored rums. Flavor rums, just, they are what they are, right? You have a base spirit and either the producers infuse it with fruit or um, other flavors, or uh, a lot, unfortunately, what, what most people actually do, most producers, is take um, extracts. So they're just taking the flavor of, of orange or lemon or what have you and just taking the extract and another chemical and dumping it into a, a white rum and then calling it a day. That's your flavored rum. Typically those can be kind of sweeter but they're good in a, in a pinch because let's say you're in a place where you don't have a lot of fresh fruit. Some of those actually come out um, pretty pretty nice, you know, the, the flavor profile. So it's a way of interjecting that flavor so you can you could put it into a drink that uh, maybe you don't have fresh strawberries or fresh watermelon or, or fresh whatever the heck, wherever you're living, you can get some flavored rum, put a little half ounce of that, and, and I apologize, my measurements are gonna be in American in the United States, uh, depending, you know, I, I don't know the metric system, I do believe it's probably a better system, I wholeheartedly agree with that, but I just don't know it, so shame on me. Um, but anyhow, you can take the flavored rum, put a half ounce of that into your cocktail, and then bingo, you have strawberry flavor or banana or what have you. So it's kind of fun. Uh, Cruzan does a lot of flavors. There's a lot of companies that do a lot of flavors. I, I'd recommend just checking out companies that are have been around for a long time, uh, not just some of these fly-by-night companies that, that pop up all of a sudden and, and you see this uh, cantaloupe flavored rum you know it might be good but it, the tried and true ones have been around for quite a long time uh, overproof rums overproof or navy rums basically <clears throat> excuse me basically that just means they're overproof right they're heavy on alcohol the average rum is going to be 40 percent alcohol by volume or 80 proof okay 
Uh, some of these rums are going to get up to 60% alcohol by volume or even up to 75, 80% alcohol by volume. That's a lot of alcohol. Uh, some of them are even, um, I think of 151, uh, uh, Bacardi 151, great for putting on a cocktail and then you set it on fire, it has a nice effect, right? Because not all alcohol is going to uh, light on fire. So um, nice if you want to add like a little pop to your drink, but also great if for, for tiki drinks or you just want to add a real punch to your drink, one of those overproof rums is going to work out well for you. And then you have aged or premium rums, just what it says, right? So uh, it takes a long time to uh, age rums properly. Oak casks, you got to think of the Caribbean. It's hot. It's going to add a lot of flavor. It's not going to add a lot of flavor because it's hot. Excuse me. Um, basically, um, in the Caribbean, you think about hot, humid temperatures, right? You have the barrel, you have oak wood, the alcohol is sitting in it, and then as the heat, um, heat is going to expand the wood. The alcohol is going to absorb more into the wood. And it's going to pick up more, more of those oak lactones, more of those flavors. That's the vanilla. Uh, that's the woodiness, the nuttiness that you would associate with wooden barrels. Most often, the barrels are, are used uh, whiskey barrels, right? And with whiskey in the United States, they have to char the barrels. So um, and by char, I mean, you know, just burn the inside of the oak barrel. So it gets a level of charcoal on the inside, right? So once it's uh, used for uh, whiskey, um, they, they sell those barrels off and then they put rum in it. Picks up a lot of flavor there. Um, again, with the vanilla, the cinnamon, spices, any, anything associated with trees, right? Uh, not so much the green notes because those are kind of uh, grown out. Um, grown out, they're, they're dried out um, as the wood matures. But that's basically age or premium rooms. Those, you're not gonna really mix those with cocktails because it's kind of a waste. When you think of, um, maybe if you know the mimosa cocktail, right? The mimosa cocktail is champagne uh, or, or fizzy wine, right? Prosecco, some sort of um, cava, a, a, a sparkling wine of some sort. If you buy, um, Bouffe Clicquot or Boe Chandon, one of the more expensive brands, and then you put orange juice in it, it kind of, like, what was the point of that? You can do it. By all means, you can do it. But it's, you know, did you did you waste the flavor? Because they spent a lot of time making the Boe Chandon. You know, you, you may be kind of wasting your dollars. So they're kind of the same thing with the rums, right? With the aged, the premium rums. Those are really meant to be uh, just on the rocks. You a couple ice cubes, one or two ice cubes a splash of water perhaps, or just by itself and sip it slowly, not taking in shots. Again, I just think of the United States and how people drink here. Uh, it's not really meant to be taken in shots. And then lastly, um, I have uh, cachaça. Um, cachaça uh, is very similar to, essentially it's a rum uh, agricole, agricultural, right? So cachaça is the rum of Brazil, the national drink of Brazil. Um, I got to spend some time there a few years ago. Brazil, beautiful country. Uh, I was in Rio. And how they make the cachaça is just how they make the rum agricole. So again, it's the sugar cane, cut it, squeeze the juice out, ferment, distill, bottle it, right? Sometimes it's aged. There's a, a lot of aged cachaça. There's so many cachaças. Those are, aren't really prevalent here in the United States. I don't know how they are in your uh, part of the world, but they're wonderful. Cachaça is going to be more, again, more uh, vegetal, more floral, uh, more green, grassy kind of flavors, um, and also more complex when you age it. Um, really enjoy it. There's just not a whole heck of a lot of it here in the United States, um, at least where I've seen. I'm here in Miami, and this is actually probably the most tropical place in the United States, and there's just not a whole heck of a lot of it here. But uh, it's a, it's a great product. And we'll learn about that when we're making the uh, Kuiperina pretty soon. We're getting to that point. Uh, and then lastly, I have Martinique AOC rum. Rum spelled with an H. Again, that is the French style uh, from the island Martinique. Martinique rum AOC is, um, how would I put this? It's 
uh, protected. Uh, AOC stands for, I believe it's Appalachian uh, Origini Controle. Again, I don't speak French and I'm very uh, apologetic for that. So essentially though, it just means it's a protected item. For something to be called Rum Martinique AOC, it has to be made on the island of Martinique and it has to be made a certain way or in certain regions. Just like uh, brandy or uh, certain brandies or champagne is made. So uh, to be a cognac brandy, you have to be made in the cognac region of France. And then there's other stipulations of what grapes you can use, uh, Uni Blanc and, and other, other stipulations of how it's aged and how you do it. Um, cognac can only be made cognac. I can't make cognac here in Miami, right? Uh, champagne. Champagne is just fizzy wine. You know, it's sparkling wine made in champagne. Again, they have a lot of stipulations. Uh, I've been through there. If anybody has a chance, champagne is beautiful. The people were so nice and the tours were amazing. Um, so highly recommend that if you get a chance. Uh, but again, it's a protected name that other countries around the world recognize because not all countries agree to these standards. Martinique rum AOC is one of those protected items. Um, but essentially, it's a French agricultural rum, and it's light, it's dry, it's floral, delicious, uh, and it's great um, also when they age it. So that's kind of the, the types, more or less. So um, hopefully that gives you a good understanding of rum in general. Now I guess we'll get to the, the more fun part um, of making some cocktails. So uh, I'm going to do a couple cocktails today. Um, We'll start off with uh, a daiquiri. Okay, a daiquiri is a classic Cuban cocktail. Um, now, people might think you need a blender. None of the drinks we're doing today are going to need a blender. Um, I don't know if I should be zooming in a little bit closer. Hopefully, you can see me. But we'll, we're going to try it this way to see. I guess just send something on the chat if you want me to zoom in, zoom in a little bit better. Um, the Daiquiri, the classic Cuban daiquiri, was invented sometime around the Spanish-American War uh, time, and it was a favorite drink of Ernest Hemingway, the writer, and uh, John F. Kennedy, the president. So that's kind of like a little a fun fact for you. It's a basic sour drink, so it um, should be pretty easy. So excuse me as I get some of these things a little better situated. So um, we're going to start off. Um, you start off with a, a, a jigger. Um, depending on where you're from, you may or may not have seen these too much because some people just free pour the alcohol. Now you have these controlled spouts for a reason. The there's a little uh, hole here on the top, and depending on how you hold the uh, the flow, controls how much liquor is going to come out of the bottle. I personally like to see when people are using the jigger because it means I'm going to get a measured amount of alcohol. The essentially cocktail making is going to be like baking. You have to have, well, <laughs> you it's it's more forgiving than baking because I understand baking is kind of a pain. Um, but you need to have measured ingredients to have a consistent drink every single time. When you're kind of eyeballing things, and, and I've been known to do that myself, it it gets the ratios off, and then you can have a drink that's either too sweet or too strong with alcohol or too acidic because there's too much lime, too much whatever. You really want to have it so that it's a nice balanced cocktail every single time. I like to use the analogy of that because um, I've, I've made drinks that I, because I usually personally taste every single uh, drink. It's, I've had drinks that come out perfectly, and then people say, well, I didn't taste the alcohol. Well, good. You weren't supposed to taste the alcohol. When you when you make blueberry muffins, do all you want to taste is blueberries? That's, that's not how it works, right? So you want to taste the butter and, and, and the, uh, the dough or whatever, you know, whatever muffins are made of. The, the muffin, you want to taste the muffin, right? The spice and, and, and all that kind of stuff. You don't want to just taste uh, blueberries. So when you're making these cocktails at home, you should be aiming for a nice balance on your palate. Of acidic to uh, you know with the lime to sweetness um, and any bitterness you know like everything should play 
well together and not be one dominant flavor compared to another. But that's just how I, I think it should be, right? So um, here we go. We have our classic uh, recipe. We're gonna start off with, and I, I might go a little bit big, because you gotta think this is a bigger glass too. So the recipe that I have is gonna be about three ounces of liquid. Then you shake it and maybe he's gonna, uh, with the ice and the water, is gonna chill it down to about four ounces. This is a seven ounce glass though. So when you're making these cocktails, you gotta think, if I do a four ounce cocktail, it's gonna come out to here. So the only way to fix that is to make sure that you either increase the ratios. So you don't wanna just have one more thing than another, or um, you could just shake the hell out of it to try to get some more ice and water out of it to kind of stretch the drink. But nobody likes a watery drink, right? So uh, that being said, we're gonna start off, so I'm gonna go with uh, two ounces of Bacardi rum. And then I'm doing, um, this is fresh squeezed uh, lime juice. And I, I wish I had a better uh, vessel for this, but we're gonna do an ounce of lime juice. And I hope you can, I hope you all can see me. And then we're gonna do um, half ounce to three quarters of simple syrup. Simple syrup is just that, it's simply syrup. It's sugar and water. Really easy, easy thing to make at home. I bought this just because I was in a hurry, but basically it's, it's white granulated sugar to water. And you just heat up the water and stir in the sugar. So the ratio is typically two to one. Two cups, and again, my uh, American measurements, two, two parts, let's say this, two parts um, granulated sugar to one part water, okay? Heated water. And all you're doing is just mixing in the water until it's clear. And you can keep adding sugar actually until it rings clear. Um, a lot of bartenders like to do that so it's a little bit more uh, thicker and it adds a little bit more texture to your cocktails. So you can go to a little bit more than that, uh, two parts to the water. If it's at a certain point, you're not gonna be able to dissolve the sugar anymore and then it's gonna be kind of cloudy and it, 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 it's not right. So it's not right for the cocktail and it also adds too much sugar. So I personally like drinks to be a little bit on the sweeter side. That's just how I am and it's, it's my bad, but uh, up to you on how much you wanna do it. So the recipe though calls for half ounce to about three quarters ounce. So I'm gonna probably go about three quarters ounce. So with the jigger here, this kind has two ounces, up to two ounces is the lid, uh, the top on one side and then this is one ounce on, on one side. So we're doing three quarter ounce, and that. Now I also add the ice uh, last. Now the reason I do the ice last, I've, I've seen different ways. Um, I don't like to water down the drinks. So typically if I'm, you know, especially here in the tropics, if I start making a drink and then I get backed up with something else, if I already put ice in that glass, by the time I come back to it, even if it's just a minute or two, that thing is, is it's water. Nobody likes a watery drink, right? So um, think about that when you're making your cocktails. If you're in a cooler climate, that might not be a problem for you, but that's basically kind of how I like to do it. So we'll go from there. We're going to uh, scoop up some, some ice cubes and uh, usually I have a better way to do this, but you know, I'm here in the house. We're gonna just have the ice how it is. <laughs> um, so I have the liquid, I have the ice. This is a classic shaker, a Boston shaker stuff. Put it on top and then put it on top. Now, it depends on, uh, you get your own style kind of for shaking and stuff like that. Uh, I'd like to do it for about it depends on the drink, but some drinks you're just trying to mix the ingredients. This one you're also trying to cool it um, and maybe dilute it a little bit if there's not enough base ingredients. So for here, we'll do a double strain. So with one strainer, I'm gonna say double strain. The reason you might do that is to catch some of the ice, um, ice particles that might come out. So from here, we go in there. 
Hopefully you can see that. All right. And then let's go from here. Awkward. <laughs> We're going to do uh, a little uh, lime wheel as a garnish. And then here is your classic daiquiri. Okay. So put that over here. Okay. One down. <laughs> so next we have uh, Mai Tai. Okay. So the Mai Tai, uh, there's a lot of different variations of this drink. Mai Tai kind of is coming from the tiki culture of the 1940s uh, when soldiers were coming back from the South Pacific, they kind of were reminiscent of, of you know, Hawaii and, 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 and Fiji and those kind of areas that they were stationed in. And, and Vic, uh, um, excuse me, Crater Vic, uh, Victor Bergeron um, kind of took advantage of that uh, in the Bay Area. He created Trader Vic's uh, and kind of helped lead the tiki style um, revolution, if you will, of the 1940s into the 60s that was real popular. Everybody wearing, you know, tiki drinks, thatched roofs, Hawaiian shirts, that kind of thing. Uh, this drink is going to be the classic based off of his original recipe, uh, but some call for pineapple juice, orange juice, just all sugar and stuff like that. This version is not like that. There's nothing wrong with those versions. I like pineapple juice myself, so I might enjoy a version like that. But this is basically more the rum, um, the orgeat uh, syrup, which is almond. Uh, I think there's a little bit of orange in there as well. Uh, syrup, it's like a sugar syrup uh, mixed with the rum <clears throat> and simple syrup and some lime juice. So it's a pretty easy drink. Um, and it's really enjoyable though, uh, very refreshing. Um, but that orgeat syrup really adds a different element that you may or may not be familiar with. I really suggest you try it because it adds just a, a, a different flavor profile than you may or may not be used to. So again, this isn't going to be a sweet, well, it's differently sweet uh, than the pineapple or orange juice versions. But go ahead and Google different things. You'll be surprised on all the different variations that you might see. But here we go uh, with that. So with this, I'm going to need the orgeat. I'm going to need the um, orange uh, curacao. And then I have the simple syrup and the rum. So this one, got an old-fashioned glass. Old-fashioned, um, as you may or may not know, there's a drink called an old-fashioned. This is what it goes in. This also might be referred to as a double rocks. So typically a rocks glass is going to be more narrow and maybe a little shorter. It's meant for drinks just served neat or maybe on the rocks, a couple of rocks, uh, a couple ice cubes. This one is just a, a extended version of that. So put that down, I guess for the purposes of you seeing what I'm doing here. Um, we're going to, it's um, also, excuse me, I should, I should mention this drink is meant to be served on crushed ice. I don't have any crushed ice. I kind of ran out of time to crush this ice, but you get the basic idea of what we're doing here. So uh, we'll start with the fresh lime juice. We're going to do three uh, quarter ounce of fresh lime juice. Okay. We're going to do a half ounce of the orange curacao. Uh, we have a quarter ounce. I like the orgat, um, orgat uh, syrup, so I'm actually going to do a half ounce just because I like the flavor of it. Uh, so that's the uh, orgat syrup. And then we're doing a quarter ounce of uh, simple syrup. Uh, the original recipe calls for demerara, demerara simple syrup. So you could uh, make that yourself or purchase that. Uh, since I just had this regular simple syrup, I'm going to use that instead. So we'll go with that. And then I have a nice uh, Appleton Estate uh, Jamaican um, Jamaican rum. So I really enjoy this rum. Uh, it calls for the original recipe pot distilled or perhaps blended rum. So I kind of think the original flavor profile, they were looking for uh, darker rum. So uh, this is a darker rum, it's good quality. So 
and we're going to go from there. So we'll bring two ounces of that. Okay. Again, I use the, uh, I do the ice last. Um, so we'll do this. Excuse me. For my hands, the regular situation, I could, I could scoop it a little bit better. Uh, we're also going uh, we'll to ice the ice the drink. Ice the drink. And again, that should be crushed ice, ideally, but this works as well. And I am going to get some ice in there. Mix on it. This is just a regular um, tray. So a cleaner on top. And hit it there. So this is your classic uh, Mai Tai, as uh, Trader Vic liked to do it. Apparently, back in the 1970s, uh, one of his regulars for one of his restaurants. Uh, used to like it with a float. So I think that's kind of how a lot of people got uh, confused on how um, there's different types of rum and uh, different fruit juices and such, so many variations on this certain drink. So myself included, I like a little bit of a float. So what I tend to do, so let's see if you can kind of see what I do here. I like to do a float of alcohol over the top. Uh, that's when a spoon comes in handy. There's a bar spoon. You don't have to use a bar spoon. You can use any spoon. But the purpose of it is to kind of drizzle the alcohol over the top so that it layers and sits. Uh, you know, the Myers rum is a heavier type rum. It's so with any dark rum, it's going to um, kind of sit on top. So with that, I like to just kind of drizzle slowly over the top. And then you can get a nice, um, I'll pull that up so you all can see that. Um, let's see here, let's get a nice garnish on there for you. And with the mint. So the reason you, you always got to slap the mint. Okay, I learned this a long time ago. Um, with slapping the mint, it expresses some of the oils and it, it gets some of that, that aromatic uh, out there for you. So when you take that first sip, that's what you're really getting is the lime and the mint, and it's just it's just amazing. So I think my mint's dying here a little bit, but the original, let's get a nice lime on there for you. So this is a classic Mai Tai with a variation of the dark rum floater on top. Okay. Get these things out of the way. I apologize. Okay, um, moving on. We have mojito, uh, another Cuban drink. So let's see here. Now, mojito was apparently invented in Havana, Cuba. I knew it was from Cuba. I had to do some looking to see where it was from, um, as far as what part of Cuba. And apparently, it was, you know, invented to help with some dietary issues as a medicine of sorts because it has mint. And it has lime and that prevented scurvy. So supposedly that with some sugar is gonna make you feel better. And I love mojitos. I used to make them as a kid for my for my dad. Uh, we had a big mint thing in the backyard. So my dad would have me go get some mint, uh, you know, crush it down for him, and then he'd make his mojito. So I, I have a fondness in my heart for this drink. So uh, tall, um, this is kind of a big Collins glass. You wanna have a tall glass, this is a tall drink. Um, oh, and I forgot the um, uh, club soda. So we're going to do this, and you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. I, I do apologize. I just remember. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, mint, lime, rum, and club soda are the ingredients. And I do apologize. I forgot the club soda. We're going to use water just so you get an understanding of, of, of how that looks. We're thinking this is club soda. <laughs> so with this drink, um, we're gonna do uh, Bacardi white rum, uh, Don Q uh, from Puerto Rico, also an amazing rum. I was very fortunate a long time ago to be able to personally tour the facilities with uh, Roberto Serrarez, who is the, um, the owner of the company and amazing, amazing uh, guy. And 
you know, I took me all through the facilities, but their rum is actually more popular than rum, uh, excuse me, it's the most popular rum sold in Puerto Rico, even over Bacardi, which is like a, you know, worldwide brand. So it's, a, it's a wonderful product. If you can get it, I would suggest you try it. They're Grand Viejos, won a, a bunch of awards. I don't get paid by them, so this is just a, a personal recommendation that I like their products and that I like Roberto. He's such a nice guy. I'd like to give him a shout, a shout out. So, uh, with the with the mojito, this is going to be a build actually. Now that I think of it, uh, this is going to be a build in the glass. So you want to have nice mint leaves. I was lucky to secure some some nice big leaves here. Um, different recipes call for different amounts. I like to get a fair amount of mint because it it you know it's a minty sweet limey drink, right? Um, so get some together. And sometimes it's kind of tough depending on what part of the world you live in. Uh, and I usually tear them a little bit just to kind of get it going. And you have about a half ounce. And again, if you like less sweet or more sweet, that's up to you. So I do have like a half ounce of simple syrup. And then we're going to do, um, you can either muddle the lime juice. Uh, excuse me, muddle fresh limes in it or have fresh lime juice. I would like to do um, the fresh lime juice and then muddle the, <clears throat> the sugar, the simple syrup, the lime and the mint together. So muddling, this is a muddler, all you're doing is kind of crushing things together to get it so that you're expressing the oils. You're breaking up, you're tearing the, uh, the mint leaves so that you get those flavors out, right? So you crush it and get in there, and then maybe I'll throw in a couple limes. And again, the lime juice is already in there. You got to be careful not to over crush limes. That's kind of why I like to use fresh lime juice as opposed to muddling limes. The limes skin has oils in it, and it gets um, kind of bitter. The pith you may be familiar with. So the if you over muddle it, then the, the drink gets kind of bitter and, no, and nobody likes a, a bitter mojito. So um, do a couple of twists of that. But essentially you're just kind of mixing the sugar, the, the, the mint and the lime juice kind of get a nice thing together. Uh, from there you have um, you do two ounces. Total air, a little over, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, and that's your base. You're gonna add, some ice cubes. Okay. Again, this is club soda, or it's supposed to be club soda. And you're going to top it off. This is a bigger glass than uh, I might typically use, but for the purposes of demonstrating things today, I thought that would be a little bit easier. So, Get this in, and then we're going to do a stir, okay? And when you stir it, so this is a basic stir, and there's a reason why there's these little curved grooves in a bartender's spoon. It's so that you can, you know, stir it nice and easily, and I like to kind of go up to kind of make it, you know, get that mint all over the place. Hopefully you can, you can see that all nice and sexy. Uh, and then put that together. Here's our sugar cane from before. That's a nice little garnish. We're gonna do uh, a mint topper. And we're gonna go like that. And then we're gonna do a nice uh, line <coughs> as well. Maybe another ice cube. And there you go with, okay. So let's do a wheel. Why not? That's pretty. And that's a sexy drink right there, right? So then you have your mojito, okay? Hopefully, you can, can, you, can you all see that? Let's see that drink. Uh, and then lastly, we're going to do a Caipirinha. Caipirinha, national drink of Brazil. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, was in Rio, had an amazing time, and I got to learn how to make Caipirinhas. A, ver a variation of this drink is called a Caiprosca. So take out the cachaça and put vodka in. And then you have, it's essentially the same drink, but with vodka. So cachaça, again, uh, this is probably the number one brand 
There's a lot of different cachaças out there. Again, not a lot made it to the United States, uh, but this one you're pretty sure to see it here and maybe other countries. I don't, I don't know their uh, distribution. Um, with Cachaca 51 is another popular one, um, but great um, agricultural or agricultural style rum. Again, remember fresh sugar cane juice, right, to make this stuff, right? Essentially, a caipir, uh, a caipirinha is going to be a, a kind of a mojito with no mint uh, and no club soda. So the it's it's just a sweet, limey drink. With that, we're going to have old-fashioned glass. We're going to put in quite a few. Um, actually, we're going to put in a whole lime. So how I learned to do this was in in Rio. So hopefully you can kind of see this line, right? Again, I mentioned that there's going to be oils and bitterness in the um, in the pith and the, the skin of the lime, right? So what the person taught me to do was you take a whole lime and then you take the skin off in half. So because you still want some of those oils, because yeah, it's going to add a little bitterness quality to it that you want, but not too much. Instead of just grabbing a handful of limes and going from there. So this is the preferred, this is the Brazilian method, at least <laughs> for the Brazilian I spoke to. This is how you do it, right? So uh, I'm going to go from here, uh, throw that in there, and then we're going to have a simple syrup. I, again, like kind of sweeter drinks, so we're going to go three quarters ounce, maybe to one, and you do that kind of up through yourself, right? Throw that in there. Now, uh, we go and start muddling away. It gets kind of hard when you got a whole lime in there. Hopefully you can kind of see, see what I'm doing. <laughs> you don't want to muddle in the air because I've had that go wrong, right? But essentially I'm just crushing the lime to really get the, the lime and the sugar mixed really well together. Another way to do this is, is to chop that lime up a lot more than I had it. It was more for demonstration purposes. So easier to do it like that is just take the skin off of half and then chop that into a couple pieces so that it's easier to crush because this is kind of a kind of a pain <laughs> to be quite honest with you. But so on we move. So you just crush it down there a little bit. Okay. And then we're going to add uh, two ounces. I typically like to go a little heavy. So two ounces, you know, two and a half, or not, um, of the cachaça, okay? And then we're gonna add the ice. Get it like that. And then, I apologize if you can't see what I'm doing. And then we're just gonna give it a nice couple stirs. Hope I'm good on time here, not wasting anybody's time. So we've started. You really want to give it a nice stir to get the sugar. You have a nice piece of lime there, you can kind of see. Again, this drink, it's your drink, you're on Ipanema, drink, uh, Ipanema Beach. Think about it, you know, nice hot day, you're in the water, and then this is in your hand, right? It's a sweet, limey, Kind of green, kind of taste green because of the limes, and a green because of the, um, the herbal or, or vegetal kind of taste of the cachaça. So, aside from that, so you're all stirred up there. That goes there. Another lime wheel, and there's your drink. So, uh, hopefully, you all can see those. Let's see if we can, can we see all the drinks here. All right, so we have your mojito, your mai tai, daiquiri, and caipirinha. So thanks for spending some time with me. Uh, that's kind of about it for me. Hopefully you learned a little bit about rum. I really have a passion for it. I just, in drinks in general, if you're interested, if you had a good time, you learned something, you want to learn a little bit more, I have, oh, as I mentioned previously, bevydu.com. Check it out. 
the uh, good people here at ASW, they're going to give you the promo code I have. So uh, please uh, check that out. It's good for half off of uh, a whole year membership. So usually $69 US. It's going to be uh, $34.99 US for a whole year. All my courses. How stuff's made. How um, different things uh, that taste. How different things taste. You know, different uh, flavors, different uh, flavors, aromas, uh, techniques on how to mix the drinks. It's not so much as me talking like this, um, but you're really going to get a lot of information. I'm starting to build more recipe videos, but it's all videos as far as where things are from, what they taste like, and how you're going to be able to taste something, uh, be able to look at a bottle and know what it tastes like, more or less, without having to try everything out there. So thank you again for everybody for your time. Hope you had some fun. And uh, I think that's about it for me. Enjoy your Friday afternoon or whatever time it may be where you're at. Thanks a lot, everybody. Take care.